Support for Conversations Live comes from the Gertrude J. Sont Endowment and from viewers like you. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Conversations Live, coming to you live from the newly named Dr. Keiko Miwa Ross WPSU Production Studio. I'm Carolyn Donaldson. Cooking at home has taken on a whole new life during the COVID-19 pandemic. Stay-at-home orders and self-quarantining left millions of people, not just with spare time to cook, but a necessity to cook at home. How have our attitudes towards cooking and food changed over the last year? How has it affected where we get our food and our local restaurants? And what kind of cooking trends are likely to remain in the post-pandemic world? Here with us to discuss these questions and more, and to offer a few great cooking tips, we're joined tonight by Duke Gastiger, co-owner of ReFarm Cafe at Wim Swept, along with his food composer, Shane Orndorff, Tamara Fatemi, producer of WPSU's World Kitchen and also our events coordinator, and Beth Egan, Professor Emeritus in Food Service Management at Penn State. You too can join tonight's conversation, whether you are watching us on air right now, online through our live stream, or perhaps listening to us on the radio right now. Our toll-free number in all cases is 1-800-543-8242. This is a conversation and we want you to be a part of it. You can also email us in that address if you'd rather send us a question that way to our experts, connect at WPSU.org. Duke, Shane, Tamara, Beth, thank you all for joining us safely and remotely in this case. Well, we're gonna begin, if we can, with a look at when that pandemic began and life literally kind of stopped and things really shut down. Everything changed, as we know, in our world and including our association with food. And what did each of you see in respect to the food industry and your food and your your perspective of food at that time. So Beth, let's let's begin with you. What did you see happening as we changed really our life uh, at a standstill last year? Well, the title of the show, more people were cooking at home because you had to, right? And I think uh, we found that sometimes we couldn't find the ingredients we wanted. Um, there were shortages of things. Uh, we started to get tired of what we usually made if we were cooking at home prior to the pandemic. So we wanted to try to find new things to do. Uh, most people know um, sourdough, right? <laughs> Everybody was uh, trying to make sourdough or if they weren't making sourdough, maybe they were just trying to make bread. So people got kind of bored. They wanted to try new things. I found a lot of um, friends and, and uh ideas myself on social media. So there were big uh, ideas out there. There's something even called pandemic coffee uh, and TikTok videos came out. We saw lots of videos and cooking shows on, on TV, teaching us new things. So just all kinds of different things to try. And I think people had time and an interest in trying new things. Sounds great. And we'll get to a closer look at some of those cooking demos and different things. But Duke, from a restaurateur perspective and entrepreneur, uh, tell us a little bit about your perspective there, having that restaurant and the changes that you saw and what you did to adapt. Well, every day you woke up and, and uh, you figured how you were going to reinvent yourself <laughs> and way that works with you to get through another day. It, it, it literally changed uh, from day to day. Mm -hmm. um, we also had a responsibility to our community, you know, that it's it's uh, pretty easy. I've been doing this for 50 years, so it's pretty easy to serve people um, in a standing restaurant. Um, you have a finite number of people. Everybody files in, files out, they're happy. Uh, all of a sudden, uh, nobody could come into your restaurant. They still want to eat. Mm -hmm. needed nourishing good delicious foods so we spent uh, and we are still spending our time is finding the best way to get really good food to our community 
Good point. And we'll get much more into details, especially about some philosophies that the folks at Reform Cafe, um, Reform Farm at Windswept are doing. And Tamara, I have to preface everyone by saying that Tamara is our resident cooking experts. So, uh, Tamara, um, just even as a, uh, as a, as a mother, as a wife and grandmother, you know, what were, what did you see among all your friends and yourself when the pandemic started? And what did you do both personally and professionally? Well, as you said, um, everybody was looking for something to do because we all got so tired of the same old things. You know, we were all used to occasionally going out to dinner or ordering in and we weren't able to do that anymore. So we all started cooking and we got sick of our own cooking. So everybody was looking for something else. Um, I know my sisters and I had kind of a text going where we were like giving each other ideas for what to cook each night or, you know, saying what we cooked and sen sending pictures to each other. And then professionally, you know, we were looking for ways at the station to stay engaged with the people that we normally would have been doing in-person events with. So we uh, came up with the idea to start this online uh, digital option for a cooking program. And, um, you know, for me, being a, in a, a multicultural family, I was used to cooking a lot of foods from other countries. And a lot of my friends said, hey, you should, you know, you should write a cookbook or you should, you know, show this to everybody else. And so it kind of worked out that we kind of were able to do both. We were able to engage with our, um, you know, our people who might normally be coming to in-person events, which is my day job. And um, I put that together with what I do at home uh, and for family and friends, which is cooking international foods. Um, so bringing that and international chefs uh, mm -hmm. in the area in as well to cook with me. That was always the plan. And um, it's worked out really well. We started back in October and we're still going. That sounds great. And actually, we've got a short little blip of one um, one of your earlier editions of World Kitchen. And folks just joining us, we want to hear from you. 1-800-543-8242. Let's take a look at a recent World Kitchen that was done literally in Tamara's kitchen. <laughs> and we'll come right back out with more. So welcome to episode three of World Kitchen. This episode is going to feature holiday cookies from around the world, cookies from Japan, Iran, Russia, Brazil, and a really fun Kwanzaa cookie. So we'll get started. The nice thing about these Kwanzaa cookies is that they're very natural in the ingredients. Maple syrup, our two teaspoons of vanilla extract. I think those are about ready to go into the oven. Pretty little indentions in the cookie. So you're gonna roll the balls out like we did before and put them on the cookie sheet. And we will go ahead and take those over there. Roll it into a ball. I'm gonna go ahead and do this one in some nuts. Scoop these over a little bit. These are all of the cookies we made today. I hope that you will all join us in January. One way or another, my friend Ping will be um, showing you how to make Chinese dumplings. Thank you. That has now hit some pretty good um, numbers. And Tamara, I'm gonna bring you back on to just ask you another question about how you saw that grow and evolve and who, who tuned in? I know this was done on our social media. And um, what did you see? I, I understand it wasn't just one person in other, per you know, people were cooking along with you and families were joining you? We did start small, you know, the first month or two, we had a smaller crowd. And then over time, I think more and more people learned about it. And we've grown um, every month, pretty much. Um, our Shandong dumplings in January was a huge hit. I think our chef there had a huge following here and around the country of friends who tuned in for that one. Um, yeah, we often have people cooking along with us. Um, I'd say, you know, anywhere from five to 10 uh individuals or families cooking with us. And then we also have people who are just watching. 
we archive this on the website so people can come back and watch it at any time. And we know um, by looking at the metrics that people do, they, that for the most part, people come by, back and look at it later and um, maybe cook along with it, you know, just on their computer um, in, in, on, in an evening or something like that. And it was families, individuals. Um, we've had people from all over the United States watching and even some people from other countries because it is um, on the computer so they can just tune in. We can be connected in many ways. And as a non-cook who tried some of Tamara's recipes, I can tell you firsthand, she made she makes them very easy. And the different cooking demos that you find out there are fairly easy. Thank you, Tamara. Now, we've got our first caller calling in. So I want to bring back on my panel here. And Shelly from Bradford, you're on the line right now this evening on Cooking from Home. Your question to our panel. Hi. I just explained that I really didn't have a, a question. I just have... A uh, little tidbit of information of what I've been doing here in Bradford uh, since COVID hit last March. Um, every evening, Monday through Friday, I post the day's date, and I simply ask, what's for dinner? <laughs> then I proceed to say what my husband and I had for dinner, and then I just put out the simple question, you, with a question mark, <laughs> and... I have been getting probably 50 to 60 responses every night just from our local friends. Um, they share recipes. They share evening um, leftovers. That, and, that, and it's just been a lot of fun. That's a wonderful effort and a great example of what food can do. And so I'm going to throw that question. Thank you for calling that in and letting us know about that. I'm going to throw that out to our panel. I don't know who wants to comment about how can food be that that rallying cry of, of, of kind of gathering together, even if it is virtually. What, what have you found in your worlds? Uh, Duke, did you have a perspective on that as you kind of branched out in the different areas at ReFarm or Beth in your research? Yeah, I, I think that uh, uh, from the personal note, uh, we had more planned family dinners. Um, you know, that being in this business, you're always finding excuses of, of uh, being too busy and not having time to get together. Mm -hmm. um, so we were able to, to plan our week a little bit better to have that time. And there is nothing uh, that binds people more together, that connectedness that we talked about, that food and sharing food um, amongst uh, friends and family or, and neighbors. Um, we, we got to know a lot of our neighbors during the pandemic because uh, we were able to uh, touch uh, their hearts that way with food. So it was a, it's, a, it's a very special time uh, for working on that connectedness. And Beth, I know you did a little bit of research for us ahead of tonight's program, taking a look at the different age demographics and, and how this may continue, this cooking at home. Can we take a look at what you found as far as, you know, depending on the age group, um, will people continue this? And, and will other Shelleys from Bradford's continue to put social media posts out and, and have some uh, connected connectivity that way? I think... Um I found myself cooking with my daughter, um, and of course, I'm in one of those categories, and she's in another one. <laughs> <laughs> we won't say which. That's fine. And, and um, one of the things she said was, she, I, I really did try to teach my daughters to cook as they were growing up and have them involved, but she didn't seem to think she remembered very much, um, and so um, we had a lot of fun. Um, cooking. And I think when you have to cook a meal by yourself, it can be a chore. Mm -hmm. But when you cook with someone else, it's a whole time to have a conversation. So like Duke said, um, as well, I know I, I have friends um, who got on Zoom and mm -hmm. made family, traditional family recipes together. So at the holidays, um, they all made a certain dish and then they sat down to eat it and that kind of thing. So I think there was a lot more family cooking. And I think that that will, we will see that um, younger people who, you know, they maybe didn't do so much cooking growing up. They didn't have as much cooking and learning to do that in school with family and consumer science and home economics, et cetera. But now 
they were almost forced to learn mm -hmm. um, some of the things that um, they didn't know. And they are some of the groups that you see even at a higher percentage think they will continue to cook at home because now they know what they're doing. And I just have to add to Tammy. So a, a funny little story that um, years ago, uh, I said to my daughter, sometime for my birthday, you can make me a pumpkin roll because I really like pumpkin roll. And it isn't something that I cook. We made other kinds of jelly rolls and things, but mm -hmm. not, not pumpkin roll. Because my cousin always brought some a pumpkin roll to a family um, thing, so I didn't make it. So when Tammy's program was having pumpkin roll, uh, my daughter and I got on and actually cooked along with the program. Um, and, uh, you know, it was great. So... And I think people are doing that in all kinds of ways with TV shows, with um, YouTube videos, mm -hmm. with things, the, the shows like Tammy's producing, um, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and enjoying it. That's for sure. That's great. And speaking of demonstrations, we have an expert right there in the kitchen tonight. So I'd like to have uh, Duke and a great videographer, his other and better half, Monica Gastiger, and their food composer, Shane Orndorff, demonstrate a very first cooking demonstration for us here tonight. We've got a couple planned. So Duke, take it away. What do you have for us tonight that we can take home and, and use tomorrow, perhaps in our own kitchens? Well, uh, just an introduction, um, we uh, use as much as we can from uh, Windswept. We have our own chickens, um, and uh, so many people are, are afraid of, of working with whole foods, like a whole chicken. I just went on today and, and got uh, the most current prices from our uh, grocer, who happened to have their start in New York, not naming that who they are. Uh, but they're humanely raised organic chicken, which they sell whole for $2.99 a pound. Wow. To cut that chicken just in quarters, they sell it at $3.99 a pound. It jumps that much in production. Wow. They just sell the breast of that same organic chicken. It's $5.99 a pound. So what I'm telling you, there's... Three chickens that basically everybody sells, certainly organic, um, humanely raised. Um, uh, broilers uh, are the, the uh, tenderest, the youngest. Then you have frying chickens, which are a little bit older, a little bit tougher. And then you finally have the roasting chickens, where the, the biggest ones. Um, but they all cut the same way. And you can use them for, for, for each chicken for a different style of, of cooking, uh, depending on your recipe. So Shane is cutting up a whole chicken, and he'll do it in less than a minute. Um, excuse my dog. And um, we're going to make or suggest five meals from this chicken. So not only are you saving money by buying a whole chicken, you're preparing for five meals. Shane? Um, so, I mean, break it down uh, for the chicken. Uh, the carcass makes really good stock. Um, it's really easy, as you can see, uh, once you get the hang of it. It's a lot of joints, so you're popping stuff off. Um, for whenever you're stuffing things, it's really easy. The skin's very movable and pliable, so you can easily get in and, and stuff whatever you're going to stuff if you're doing like catch tori or things like that. Um, but that's the chicken broken down fairly quickly. And we use everything in this chicken. Uh, we, if you want skinless chicken, we're taking that skin off and we're uh, rendering the fat in the chicken, fat uh, skin, and we'll use that for, uh, for cooking. Mm -hmm. uh, the skin itself, after you rent it, are a great cracklings that goes on top of salads. Uh, so the breasts we're gonna saute and we'll show you a simple sauce that we make uh, uh, from a sautéed uh, chicken breast. Uh, the wings and the, the leg, great cacciatore, the thighs, whatever, whatever you want to do with it. But uh, the neck and the carcass is great stock. I happen to be from New York, so I eat all the, the innards of the, of the chicken as well. It all gets sautéed up and goes in a nice 
mayonnaise bun for lunch. So wow. uh, I can't do it when my wife is around the kitchen because she doesn't like the smell of liver. <laughs> uh, just as a taste of what you can do and the money that can be saved. And um, my goodness, how much uh, fresher uh, and how much uh, more of a nutritious meal you have, five meals from one chicken. That's amazing. That is really so. Don't be afraid, folks. Try try your hand at that. And we'll get back to Duke and, and a look at where you can find those as part of what he's turned his uh, Reform Cafe at Windswept, um, not only as a restaurant, but a takeaway and a farmer's market of sorts with all the beautifully sourced things. So we talk about that chicken and we talk about uh, local and locally sourced things. And I want to go, if I could, to Beth right now. And again, we want to get your calls. So please don't hesitate to call us at 1-800-543-8242 or head online at connect at WPSU.org. No question is a bad question. We're talking food in all ways, and I would love to hear what you'd like to pose to our experts here. But Beth, I, I, I want to ask you about how we've also got that trend now where we're paying more attention, right? And Tamara, you can weigh in too, of, of where we're buying things and how far things are traveling to get to our home kitchens or even to our local restaurants. What have you found? Oh, it's that's um, a trend for sure. Um, I know Duke uh, plans to talk a little bit about Alice Waters, and I used to teach about her all the time. And she really started um, foraging um, around her restaurant and trying to find the local, the fresh foods, and and then building a menu from that. Uh, and it, it's actually, she started way back in the 70s, but it's really, um, we've seen it a lot more in restaurants um, and the restaurant trends the last couple of years. And then, of course, we have the whole part that's a climate and trying to reduce our carbon footprint. So um, younger folks have sort of driven that to say, I want to get my food um, closer to home. Mm -hmm. And we're so lucky in this area because we have so many farmers markets. And of course, when we couldn't find things that we wanted, perhaps in the grocery stores or our whole um, food system and the supply chain started to break down during the pandemic. Um, luckily, we were coming into spring in central Pennsylvania and um, our local farmers markets were really um, ramping up. And they were busy, I, at least from my experience. And people were looking to things um, to, that they could get at the farmer's market and then how to cook them. I saw emails from the farmer's markets to say, here's a recipe for this or here's an idea for that. Uh, so I think um, just overall, it's good for the environment. It's good for our local businesses. And we really wanted to try to support our local businesses um, even more so when the pandemic started. And another trend that the National Restaurant Association has um, put out there or that, that they're seeing is that restaurants can put are putting together meal kits. So uh, people like having kind of all the ingredients put together and measured and things like that. They can cook at home. They don't have to take the risk of going out um, and, and eating in the restaurant right now. Um, but the data shows that more than half of people like having meal kits and the younger they are, so the millennials and the Gen mm -hmm. Xers, 75% of those um, folks like having meal kits and think that they will continue to want to um, have those in their life. Great. And, and Duke, I want to go back to you real quickly because I'm one of those people that came to Refarm at uh, uh, Refarm Cafe at Windswept and, and took advantage of some of those uh, pickup items that you continue to have. Um, can you tell us about how you changed the business model and still um, had your beautiful locally sourced uh, produce and, and, and variety of, of products that are available for folks to uh, pick up and take home? Sure. Well, um, Monica and I and Shane and the rest of the composers consider ourselves extremely lucky as restaurateurs um, having this this uh, wonderful source of food right out our back doors. Mm -hmm. uh, even in the winter months, uh, we have a year round greenhouse. Uh, so we were getting beautiful uh, salad greens and herbs uh, all year round. So it is a different it is a different way to cook. Um, and um, we 
tend to bring all those flavors uh, and all that freshness to matter whether we're cooking for the for our guests at the cafe uh, or our, our home foods program called Repast. Um, or even we have, uh, for right now, we have a, a summer salads program. It's a subscription program. Uh, so every week um, that a, a uh, just a, a cornucopia of vegetables and, and greens uh, show up in your, on your doorstep with some in, simple instructions on how to make a great uh, chef salads mm -hmm. with different greens. So we're not only have this wonderful group of composers that I get to work with it on a daily basis. Unbelievably talented farmers, uh, Christina and Luke, and, and a whole bunch of other people that make it happen. Uh, but it's it's uh, it's a special way uh, to cook, and, and um, any way that entrepreneurs can bring new ways of getting good food to people is something that we're always going to support. Good point, good point. And Tamara, did you find when you were deciding on the recipes and the worlds that you were heading to and the different chefs that you tapped into, I, I recall in some cases, you were able to give tips on where they could find items, right, that maybe were part of those recipes and trying to keep it, even though um, it was the world, you could find those things, if not in person or sent to you, you could have it mailed to you, uh, depending on, on 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 the spice that was needed, et cetera. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, luckily for us in the State College area, we have a number of international markets. Um, an another new one just opened recently. Um, and so those kind of kept going during the pandemic for the most part. Um, they, they had lower stock on some things, but you could still find most of what you were looking for. Um, and as we know, you know, all of our stores went through shortages. Mm -hmm. um, in particular, I remember the, the yeast shortage that everyone suffered from in the beginning. Um, I think everyone somehow, it's, it's like it's like a snowstorm and everybody thinks they're going to need all the toilet paper in the store. Um, we all thought we were going to need all the yeast that any store had. And so I remember um, one of my neighbors ended up finding a source of a couple of pounds of yeast and she was doling it out to all the neighbors who were looking for yeast, you know, so we all got our little jar of yeast. Um, but uh, yeah, I think, you know, we found that if it, if you don't have a source, as I, I normally do, my husband travels back and forth uh, from the Middle East a lot. So he brings the spices and herbs and things I need, um, dried things uh, for me. But again, during the pandemic, he, he wasn't coming home. Um, he, he was here for a long time and then he left and he was gone for eight months. So I did um, look online and I got some online things shipped to me, but I also just you know found uh, substitutes or things that work just as well or I did look at some of those international markets. And to be quite honest, you can find things often a lot cheaper in an international market than you can in one of the big chain markets or the, uh, the New York market that Duke mentioned. Um, you know, a, a small container of something like paprika is gonna be, you know, $5 at that, that store. Whereas you're gonna get a big bag of paprika um, at the international market for three or $4. Wow. So, Pays to uh, shop around a little. Good points, good points. We have an email right now that we'd like to put up on screen and I'll read it to you. Sally writes to us, during this past year, I've developed mother health issues and a vegan diet is best for me. I think many people are cooking for health this year and I did want to get to that point. So thanks Sally for bringing this up. I'm interested to know if others have experienced this and when we can get out more, are there local restaurants, any of them, that are dedicated to eating this way? So I'll throw it out there and ask, any or all of you to comment on what you found uh, uh, for for our region, I guess, in, in respect to health and our changing diets. I can tell you that, that we um, accommodate any diet requirements, dietary requirements or allergies uh, at Reform Cafe. And it, it is something that we're used to uh, because our style of cooking um, is first of all, a la minute. So uh, there are no pre-prepared items. Uh, we can leave out or add items as, as we need to to make those, that dish delicious. So there are other restaurants that follow our our uh, methods, uh, but we normally um, have vegans, uh, dieters in, vegetarians, 
uh, you know, dairy free, gluten free, nut allergies. I think that that uh, it's our responsibility as as restaurateurs and composers and cookers. Uh, we have we have to adapt to our our clientele. They don't mm -hmm. have to adapt to us. Right. Good point. And Beth, I know that you did a little bit of quick research here. Uh, we're almost at the halfway mark and, and we'll reintroduce our panel here. But Beth, can you comment on some of the other health issues that you saw during the pandemic? I guess the COVID-19 weight gain <laughs> and it was more than 19 pounds at some persons uh, and some eating disorders that spiked, I understand, through this pandemic, right? As people were alone and anxieties and, and different things cropped up. Yeah, we saw an article recently that um, along with lots of people had more anxiety, they were by themselves, etc. It did spark um, an increase in serious eating disorders that need to be treated uh, medically. Um, but otherwise, um, also, we saw that uh, people try to eat uh, more healthfully. Uh, it, again, fewer processed foods that can think but it's kind of a, a back and forth because people wanted comfort foods, so they aren't always as healthy. Now, if you're cooking at home, there are lots of ways to make them more healthy. And I saw <laughs> cooking cooking demos and, and ideas on morning television and, again, social media on ways to do that. Uh, I have a friend on Facebook who is always taking uh, – recipes and making them vegetarian and then she posts that and other people sort of chime in on um, those ideas and she puts in the ingredients that she substitutes. So I think that there are um, lots of resources out there um, and some people gained weight, some people lost weight <laughs> um, during the pandemic. We saw, we saw a little bit of everything so you have to kind of see where um, you fit in. But I want to I want to add one thing to what um, Duke said, and again I mentioned social media at the beginning. Maybe I'm on it a little bit too much, but in our area there's a, an Eat Local group on Facebook, and so they post um, both the the restaurateurs, the business owners can post what they're doing, but also people can post a question and say. Where can I get a good vegan this? Where can I mm -hmm. get um, gluten-free um, that? And then people answer them, either, the, again, the business owners or other uh, folks. So um, in your area, reach out or look around in social media, and you can find um, some of those places where you can go out to eat for the types of um, menus that you um, want and, you know, be more healthy mm -hmm. and however it it, it's such an individual thing. Work with your doctor, dietitian, et cetera, right. to um, figure out what's um, best for you. Excellent point, Beth. Thank you for bringing that up. And and uh, do, we are at about the halfway point. So if you are just joining us, I'm Carolyn Donaldson, live from the uh, newly named Dr. Keiko Miwa Ross Studios here at WPSU. And this is Conversations Live. It's Cooking at Home right here on WPSU. And joining us tonight, we have Duke Gastiger and Shane Orndorff, both from Refarm uh, Cafe at Windswept. Tamara Fatemi, our own WPSU World Kitchen producer and event coordinator, and Beth Egan, who is uh, with the professor, uh, excuse me, faculty emeritus as part of the food service program at Penn State. Our toll-free number, because we still got time for folks to call us with questions, is 1-800-543-8242. We're ready to take your calls. You can also send us your questions by email at connect at wpsu.org. All right, let's go back to Duke, because I know um, cooking demos, they are the thing. We're seeing them. Tamara has them on our World Kitchen. You can get them on social media. But right now, tonight, we have another live cooking demonstration with a, with a hack or a, a, a special tip for us tonight from our friends at Reform. Duke, what's up? Well, sure. I did want to mention uh, an, an important thing before uh, halftime. What I noticed uh, that there is a difference between intentional eating and cooking and impulse eating and cooking. And uh, those, I became more intentional in my, my diet. Chefs are the worst eaters in the world. Uh, <laughs> we deal with heavy, rich food all day long. 
Uh, we don't want to sit down to a full, full meal. So we're more likely to get a bowl of cereal than we are to have uh, you know, a three course dinner. But during the COVID restrictions, because we had to plan meals, our eating became more intentional. When it becomes more intentional, we tend to think about not only the flavors of food, but all the nutritional uh, quality. If you're just an impulse eater, you're at the, um, you, you're in the hands of all the mass marketers in this country. <laughs> you know, They're that, winning. Yeah, you need to take control of, of that impulse and become more intentional. Okay, so we're gonna go, we've, um, we've cooked that chicken breast um, in a saute pan, and uh, we're gonna make a couple quick sauces from, from uh, the pan fond. Now, um, F-O-N-D fond, uh, if a little, charcoaly bits that usually people scrape out and put in the trash can. As a chef, that is where all the flavor in the world is. And it is the basis for so many uh, different sauces that you can make. You don't need fancy stocks. Um, you don't need bouillon cubes. Uh, certainly you don't need packets of, uh, uh, of, of any uh, gravy mix. So. We've got that, that uh, pan and Shane's gonna take you through and show you how to make two very simple sauces. All right. So as you can see, that's the fawn that you're going to have. Uh, and that's uh, what you're gonna first do with that is you're going to uh, deglaze it with some white wine. You want to get I'm doing off, a terrible job with the camera. Get off those pieces. Uh, and then as that builds up, you hit it with a little bit of uh, your onions or shallots or anything that you have that's a loom. Camera technical difficulties here. This is a little tough. We're, we're working with computers here safely in Zoom and remotely here out at ReFarm. So thank you, Shane, for adjusting it there. This, this reminds us too, and we'll talk to Tamara about the uh, um, uh, non-professional but still delightful uh, cooking that was done uh, using lots of computer laptops <laughs> through our world kitchens. Okay, what's next? Okay, so as the onions, they're, they're going to start to cook down. Um, as they cook down, uh, you're gonna see that uh, some of your pieces start to stick around the pan a little bit. Um, so you're going to hit it with a little bit of water. Um, and that's going to fry up a little bit more, helping release all that bond and anything that builds up. Um, but it's going to cook down rather quickly. Um, as it does, then you, uh, the last thing you're going to do, it's going to go for about 30 seconds here. Uh, and then as it does, uh, you've got another white wine round that you're going to hit it just to do your last deglaze. Uh, but like Duke said, this is where all of your, all of your flavors at. This is. A... And you don't need too fancy equipment either, right, Shane? No, it, uh, it it's rather simple. Um, and I mean, everybody has a, a frying pan and a spatula at home. <laughs> Very nice. Better. Okay, so as, as that cooks down, the wine's going to uh, cook off there. Um, and then you uh, just take a pat of like room temperature butter uh, and that gets folded in. And as it melts, that, that starts to bring your sauce together and that's what makes the sauce. Okay, so. It's okay to experiment then too, right, uh, Shane and uh, Duke? You know, we, we can take chances now more than maybe we did yes. before. Oh, you definitely should. I mean, uh, especially now when you're at home, a lot of people are playing around and trying new things. Um, uh, with the sauce here, we're just finishing it off with some fresh herbs, um, some salt and pepper, and that, that really just brings it together and that uh, makes it just a little bit more rich. So from uh, that, that fawn, from that, those little crunchy bits in your pan, uh, we made uh, a, what is 
called uh, Berblanc, which is a white wine butter sauce. You could use red wine instead and make it a red wine butter sauce. Uh, you could use tarragon. You could use um, uh, lemon thyme. You, whatever you have in your garden, you can use as herb. It's nice to have a fresh herb. Uh, you could add a little bit of cream to this and you can have a little bit of a cream sauce. So mm. there are so many things that you can do from this one pan. Um, and this was not an additional purpose. This uh, purchase rather, this, this, these are items that came from your cooking process. So you're, you're, not, um, you're not adding cost to your meal. Again, you're, you're getting benefits of doing it from scratch. Mm -hmm. And Duke, maybe we should bring up at this point um, that philosophy that, that I know Beth mentioned and Tamara I know uses, maybe not to the format that, that you do, but walk us through what you believe at ReFarm and kind of your mission statement around the way you value food and how perhaps we should all maybe take a closer look at, at, at the food that we uh, take in. Well, we take, uh, we think of, the, of a very intimate relationship with uh, food and people, um, not only from uh, the connections between people, but also the connections between the people and the land and the farm and the land. So it is just um, taking advantage, advantage of all that, that uh, uh, those connect, the connections that we're able to, to establish. So, uh, at Refarm Cafe, we're concerned about that connectedness. We're, we're concerned about food security, which is the local food system. Uh, we're also uh, concerned about uh, the economic viability of small farms and small restaurants mm -hmm. uh, in um, our community. Um, there's a thing called the multiplier effect, which is it, it's it's a number that we all kind of knew about, but uh, it's especially important in restaurants. Restaurants are notoriously uh, low profit areas because our, our payroll costs are so high. Um, but because of that, uh, a lot of what um, the economic impact that restaurants have, especially small restaurants, uh, in the local economy is because of that, that local payroll. Mm -hmm. So um, the numbers come out that if you are a, a chain restaurant um, or one of the big guys, um, about 34 percent, 34 and a half percent of the, the revenue you produce goes back to enrich the local economy. An independent restaurant, um, small mom and pops, uh, they give about 64 and a half percent back to the local economy. So it's not only enriching food, it's enriching the economy. Um, and that's some of the value systems. So Alice Waters is a great example. Um, it, kind of the, the, the matriarch of the, the slow food movement, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the local food, uh, food movement, uh, has one of the most successful restaurants uh, in the world, at Chez Penny, uh, does, does never learn how to cook. Uh, she just has um, an unbelievably strong value system. And uh, she puts it this way very simply so that her food philosophy is eat seasonally. And think about this, I think in, in the times of COVID and how a lot of people have been able to adapt to her philosophy without knowing about it. So mm -hmm. eat seasonally, eat locally and sustainably. Mm -hmm. Shop at farmer's markets, plant a garden, <laughs> conserve, compost and recycle. Cook simply engaging all the senses, so important. Set the table with care and respect. Eat together. And the last one we, we talk about all the time here is food is precious. And um, we take, um, uh, we, we ignore that, uh, thought about how luckily we are as communities that we don't live in food deserts and, mm -hmm. and we have food to eat and we should um, you know have that uh, off for the farmers and what they produce.
Very good points. And, and we'll talk a little bit about food scarcity and now post-pandemic and as we come out of this pandemic, how you know many local efforts are being uh, undertaken right now to help those that are perhaps in need of some food. But Tamara, I want to ask you a question about the relevance as far of world kitchens. I, I noticed that in, in how you were describing some of your world kitchens, you talk about the culture of food and how that differed. And that's part of what you bring to the table with, with your uh, cooking demonstrations. And I guess in some ways you kind of follow that food philosophy or the world does to some regard. Yeah, um, I think one of the things I've always enjoyed most about the World Kitchen and why I wanted to start it, and it was a, it was a thought long before COVID, and and it just gave us the opportunity to do it, um, was to share culture because I come from a, a long history of trying to bring cultures together and trying to um, help people to understand that everyone around the world is the same. We all want the same things. We want, you know, healthy children and food on the table and a roof over our heads. And, um, you know, the more we see how much we're alike, the better off we're all gonna be and the less tension we're gonna have and, and less conflict. So bringing culture into food and showing people how other cultures around the world eat was really important to me for World Kitchen. Um, when I'm visiting my husband's family in Iran, it's very common for us to all sit on the floor on, on what's called a sofre. Um, so it's a tablecloth on the floor and all the food is there and we all sit and eat out of family style uh -huh. bowls things get passed around. And the older I get, the harder it is to sit down on the floor <laughs> like that. But um, it's that that culture and that um, that family togetherness and the, the love of the food and the way, as Duke mentioned, everything gets used. Mm -hmm. um, Persian cooking, they use every piece of the vegetable and every piece of the animal that has, you know, uh, been been sacrificed to give us that food right. so um you know it's really important for me for everyone to understand that culture and how um even though our our personal cultures our our histories our religions all of those things may be different there's so much about our lives that is the same and right. how we all are That's the same it. Going back to uh, Shelly from Braddock, who said, you know, a simple post on her social media and people just kind of connect with food. Um, thank you, Tamara. Beth, let me ask you this, because we want to get, uh, we got about 10 minutes left in the program, and we still want to hear from you. So let's one more time uh, ask you if you can, those of you watching or listening, 1-800-543-8242 is the number to call. Don't be shy. We'd love to hear from you. You can also go and email us at connect at WPSU.org. We'll have a few more minutes to get to those questions or comments about life and food and post-pandemic and cooking at home. Um, Beth, I I know you gathered some more facts for us from for your food service management background. So let's look at these graphics about restaurants and pre-pandemic and post-pandemic, both eating in and takeout. If we can put up those graphics and, and, and Beth, you want to kind of comment on what your research has shown. Um, uh, again, adults and then breaking it down with the different demos. Who's going out for dinner before the pandemic hit and who's going to who's going to start going out for dinner here coming up? Well, you see that um, it it went down from pre-pandemic. Sure. Um, it it went down and down, and then um, and of course every state and every locality had different um, restrictions and that kind of thing. And also um, a big part of this is if people could eat outside, and uh, and what we've seen is people want to be able to continue to eat outside if mm -hmm. they can. Um, and that depends where you live in the country. Um, I personally uh, ate out at restaurants through last summer um, and into the fall and actually have a walking buddy. We are so proud of ourselves because we've supported some of our um, favorite coffee places, um, never, never eating inside, but um, always having our, our treats outside. Um, and so... Uh, things will start to come back. I'm sure they already are starting to come back. Mm -hmm. And as people get vaccinated and uh, they have um, different feelings about um, what they're willing to do. How about but, on the takeout side? Can we take a look at that graph? Is that a 
a little less dramatic? I guess people still wanted well, to support local, right? And they Right. They, and look at that pre-pandemic and then it, it went up, which is totally makes sense, right? Sure. So um, people are um, wanted to support their local restaurants. Um, they have their favorites. They don't want them to go out of business. So right. they uh, they did takeout. And it's an, that's another thing that um, we see that people really would like to have continue. That's right. Um, including and, and grocery delivery mm-hmm. and being able to pick up your groceries. And a lot of, a lot of things that um, changed, uh, well, maybe not a lot, but some things that changed during the pandemic, people do want to see continue. Absolutely, absolutely. We do have an email that came in from Chuck. Let's get to his email here. Chuck writes, I have a nonstick pan that no longer is nonstick. Do you know if there's a way to restore the pan back to nonstick? So I'm going to throw that over to Duke and to Shane. And then from there, we've got one last demo to uh, show everybody as we have about six minutes left in our program. So what do you guys think? Can you help with this nonstick pan detail or do they need to just get a new one? I yeah, uh, the, the, the coated pans, whether it's Teflon or, or, or some other uh, chemical, once they start flaking, uh, it's time to uh, recycle them. Uh, there is no uh, way short of uh, having the coating resurfaced by the company, which, you know, most pans now are 20 bucks. <laughs> You're not going to be able to uh, afford to do that. So okay. it's up another good pan. There you go. All right. Or buy cast iron, ah. um, right? Or not, you don't even have to buy it. Um, I want to bring up something that, that also uh, I see a lot of in this community. And I, I, so I know it's in State College. I hope it's other places around um, our listening area too. But that's buy nothing groups. Um, so another social media um, happening where uh, there's an organizer and it's getting to know your neighbors and people are getting rid of things or they're moving. And I've seen a lot of cast iron um, be available, um, being given away. Come get it if you'd like it. Uh, So then you don't have to, you can season that up and you don't have to worry about the coating going. There you go. Do we have enough time for a quick demo here? And then we'll have a summary wrap up and a takeaway for our viewers and our listeners tonight. Duke, Shane? Yeah, the one we're going to, so we have that delicious chicken. We're going to make a a salad dressing or a sauce for that chicken. And, um, you know, salad dressings and sauces, again, this is not scary stuff uh, that, you know, basically it's an acid and some sort of fat, which makes a good dressing. And, and there's all kinds of different fats and there's all kinds of different uh, acetic acid uh, and citric acid. And we're going to use a couple different things that you might have not thought of, but it's still going to be a delicious dressing, whether it's for salad or for the meat we just prepared. Shane? Um, so we're going to be putting together a lemon turmeric uh, coconut yogurt dressing. Um, so it, using all those things that you normally have in dressing, but they're going to be a little bit healthier and the things you just might not think of that go together. Okay. Um, we have a uh, house-made coconut yogurt that we, we put together, um, but you can purchase coconut yogurt at any supermarket. Um, but what you're going to do is you're going to put about a cup in and then uh, – you just whisk it up a little bit just to break it up and uh, get it reincorporated back into itself. Okay. Uh, we got about three minutes left, Shane. I just, if you don't mind, just uh, we want to get to everybody's uh, comments too, but please go ahead. Right here, uh, fresh turmeric um, that we have, uh, as well as fresh dill. Um, and then you have uh, some lemon juice that you slowly uh, mm. put in there um, as you're whisking it together. And as that starts to bind then, Um, you're going to then slowly uh, take your oil and you're going to slowly put that in there uh, as you're whisking quickly. Um, That just allows it to come together and it makes a simple, quick dressing for yourself. Wonderful, very aromatic. So Duke, as as Shane finishes up there, our food composer, again, he's got several of them out at the cafe and also um, the repast. Um, Your summary of what's a takeaway from what we've talked about tonight and where we're headed real briefly. And I'll start with you, Duke. Well, just quickly, you know, uh, local foods, uh, not all local foods are good. Not all farmers are great. Um, The most important thing about sourcing foods is to get to know your farmer, your producer, 
and buy from somebody that you can trust. Um, you're more likely to get a good quality uh, uh, group of vegetables or meats for your table. Um, and you can know that you can have uh, it done safely um, and deliciously. That sounds delicious. Tamara, more World Kitchens ahead for those listening and watching? Absolutely. We're going to keep going. Um, this month we're doing North Indian cuisine. Uh, next month we'll have some Italian food. And over the summer we've got a plan for a, a big barbecue show to show you a lot of uh, international barbecue foods. So, uh, you know, we hope that you will open your mind and open your palate to new foods and new worlds and uh, watch along with us one Sunday a month at two. That sounds great. And I'm going to end with Beth Egan uh, telling us a little bit about a recap of what those trends are and where we're headed and how that could be a good thing for us. Right, Beth? Oh, yeah, that isn't what I was going to say. But <laughs> um, I, I do think that people, um, once you learn to cook and uh, get it, get some experience at it and then you get more interested in it, you can prepare um, foods for yourself that are more healthy. You can find the things at the farmer's market that are of good quality. And you can also find the restaurants like Duke's where um, they're taking good care of the food and um, buying local, raising it locally, et cetera. Um, I, I, what I wanted to say in wrapping up is I heard somebody um, somewhere along the line say, uh, okay. cooking real, for yourself, cooking for yourself is a good form of self-care okay. so taking the time to put together that meal with all the different components and you should just think of it as a good way to take care of yourself and your family sounds great our guests tonight have been duke gastiger shane orndorff tamar fatemi and beth egan thank you so much for joining us thank you to our experts we hope you have a wonderful de delectable night